All right, all. Well, given that it's new now, I think we'll go ahead and get started as folks start to and keep trickling in. Um, so my name is Riley Stevenson. I'm on the Sierra Club Executive Committee uh, and going to be moderating and facilitating today. Um, so thank you everyone for being here and for joining us for the first day of our Earth Day speaker series. Just some housekeeping notes. Uh, we ask that you keep your microphone on mute throughout the presentation, just to help with background noise. You'll see that there's a microphone symbol, which is in the lower left of your screen, as shown here. If the microphone symbol is crossed through, you are muted. Next to that, you'll see a video camera symbol, and you're welcome to stay, have your video on or off through the presentation. This webinar is being recorded, just so you know, so you may be recorded if your camera is on. Um, and if you wish not to be seen, feel free to turn your camera off. Lastly, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat, which as you can see is over on the right of your screen. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat throughout the presentation and at the end we will have some time um, for some questions and answers after the presentation itself. And next, just before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land beneath our feet. Here in Maine, we live in occupied Wabanaki territory. The Wabanaki people lived on this land and stewarded it for thousands of years. In these times, indigenous communities are being hit hard by the pandemic, and in most cases have fewer resources and less support. Please consider making a donation to support your local Native American tribe. And at this point, I'll hand it off to Faye. Uh, so Faye is our speaker today. Faye is the co-executive director of the Post Landfill Action Network. Faye studied sociology and anthropology at Earlham College, where they were the founder of the EC Free Store and a leader in their school's responsible energy investment campaign. Faye studied abroad in India, Tanzania, New Zealand, Guatemala, and Mexico, where they researched waste management systems. And I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Riley. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I hope everyone has a lunch to go with today's presentation. Um, so happy to be here. Thank you so much, Riley, for that introduction and the land acknowledgement. Thank you, for me, Marina, for getting this set up. Um, really happy to be here. I am a recent uh, transplant to Maine, so this is exciting. I recently moved here from Philly. Um, so it's exciting to meet folks and get connected to the Sierra Club chapter here. So to get started, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can I get some thumbs up? Can y'all see my screen right now? Yeah, we're good. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, all right. So the name of today's presentation is a zero waste world is possible. Um, and I am presenting on behalf of the Post Landfill Action Network. And I'll tell you a little bit more about us. So Riley already covered all this. Usually I do this uh, ground setting. Um, I do want to just give some space if anyone needs time to um, remove distractions, um, get note taking supplies if you need it, center yourself, get some water. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, we're going to be talking about some pretty serious topics today. When we talk about waste, we also talk about um, systems of oppression and intersecting systems of oppression. So. If you need to, at any point, step away, I encourage you to take a deep breath. If you need to turn off or on your camera, please feel free to do so. Um, as Riley said, we'll be doing questions at the end, um, but if folks have questions throughout, you can send the question in the chat um, or raise your hand. I won't see the chat, but Riley will be getting my attention throughout um, if someone has a question. All right, so for introductions again, my name is Faye. I use she and they pronouns, and I'm the co-executive director of the Post Landfill Action Network. So I wanna invite everyone to introduce themselves as well. Um, and we're gonna do that in the chat because there are a lot of folks, as much as I wanna hear from every single one of you, I wanna invite you to put your name and your pronouns in the chat and share one word or a short sentence that you think about when I say waste. So I'm gonna give a minute for folks to do that. Mm -hmm. 
Pressure. All right, I see some coming in. I'm gonna have to catch up on these later. This is so we can all get to know each other a little bit. All right, please keep the intros going. I'm gonna move on to the next slide, but if you just joined us, please share your name, pronouns, and one word or short sentence that you think of when I say waste. All right, so for those of you who are social media savvy, um, this is our social media handles from Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn. You can find us at Post Landfill. And this is our adorable team pre-COVID um, on the left-hand side. I work with a fantastic team of 11 full-time staff members based throughout the country. Um, and we've been working digitally remotely for little over a year now, as many of us have, um, and want to give credit to all of what I'm going to present here across this team. So we are the Post Landfill Action Network. We currently work with over 700 college and university campuses across the U.S. This is our Students for Zero Waste Conference. Annually, we bring together our network of students to talk about waste and the next step for the movement. We're an eight-year-old nonprofit, and we've been growing a lot through the last eight years, learning a lot about how to build this movement for a zero waste world. And real quick, Riley, can I ask you a logistic question? Sure, yeah. Can you see at the top of my screen, is that blocked by the bar? Or is that just on my screen? The top thing I can see, it says building a movement for a zero waste world. Fantastic. Cool. Thank you. All right. So we work with college students for the most part. Um, I don't know if there are any college students on here, feel free to make yourself known. Um, but just for folks who have college students in their lives, this is basically what we do. Um, we provide campus membership for students doing waste work on their campuses. Um, and campuses be can become members of our network, which means they get all sorts of support. It's basically the support that we wish that we had had when we were students. Our staff is made up of very, very recent grads. Um, so we provide leadership skills, we provide best practices, um, we help students navigate the ins and outs of organizing on a college campus. Uh, we also do annual events, like I just mentioned, our Students for Zero Waste Conference, our regional Beyond Waste Student Summits, and we help students ban single-use disposable plastics on campuses um, and do campus-wide consulting called Atlas. Feel free to check out our website if you have questions or you're interested. Um, at the end of this presentation, I'll do a little more information on how to get involved. So for this presentation format, we're gonna do a problem solution action format. So we're gonna start by understanding the problem. I'm gonna share with you all how we understand the intersections of the waste crisis. And then I'm gonna tell you about our theory of change. And then we're gonna focus on case studies for the world that we're working towards. And finally, we're gonna chat. We're gonna discuss uh, what it looks like to maybe apply these things where we're all living now. Before I jump into any of that, I just wanted to highlight there is an event um, coming up on April 22nd that is organized by um, organizers on the Penobscot organizers um, in partnership with UMaine. So there's going to be a car caravan for, they're calling it the Caravan for Mother Earth on April 22nd, um, leaving from the UMaine campus um, and uh, looping up on Indian Island with the Penobscot organizers um, and trying to basically just make a big fuss about uh, the issues going on there with the Juniper Ridge landfill um, and the out of state waste importation. So I'll touch on this again at the end, but if folks need to leave early, just wanted to put that there was a call for, call for action um, in the um, Orno Old Town area of Maine. Okay, so jumping right in. Um, what we will not be talking about today is lifestyle zero waste. 
Um, that is not where my work sits. So we're not gonna be talking about how to reduce your specific waste in your life. We're not gonna be talking about how to keep your trash in a mason jar. Um, we can touch on some of those things if they come up, but what I wanna try and do with you all today is share with you a systemic perspective on why we have a waste problem and what we can do about it. So the way that we look at waste from an organizational perspective is a little bit beyond the common definition of zero waste. So the typical industry definition is at least 90% diversion from landfill or incinerator. So what does that mean? So you see on this waste hierarchy, that top bar, that's the standard diversion rate. The amount of material that is being recycled or being composted. But when we look at it, we want to also include reuse. We want to include reduction. We want to include rethinking and redesigning and changing the system overall. We don't want to be just looking at recycling and composting because that's not really bringing us towards the circular economy that we need to develop. So we're looking at what we call the linear consumption economy, extracting resources from the ground, producing them into products, distributing those products across the world, consuming those products and dis disposing of them. This is a linear process where we extract stuff from the ground, we make it into stuff and then we throw it away. And these are the problems that are intersecting with this. We understand this crisis by breaking it down into these five areas consumer culture, landfills and incinerators, environmental racism, global climate change, and resource depletion. And I'm gonna dive into all of these. Starting with consumer culture. Some people might have seen this image before. It's a common piece of art. Uh, we live in a culture where this is what we're told by the media, by big box stores. We define ourselves by the stuff that we surround ourselves with. Are you a sparkly iPhone cover or are you a, a matte black cover? Are you a PC or are you a Mac? We define ourselves by the stuff that we surround ourselves with. That is consumer culture and that is perpetuated in our advertising. For example, um, I wanna invite folks to take themselves off mute and make a guess as to what you think this is an advertisement for. So you can take yourself off mute and just yell it out if you think you know. Liquor? Liquor, what do other people think? Great, wine. Wine, what else? Fashion trends. <laughs> Fashion trends. Dating site. A dating <laughs> site, what else? <laughs> yeah, I missed one, what was that last one? Stockings. Stockings. Yeah, we have toast, play, dance, love, flirt, kiss. What are they selling us? It could be any of those things. This is an Urban Outfitters ad. They're selling us clothing. If they're selling us clothing, why is there barely any clothing in this advertisement? Because they're not actually selling clothing. They're selling a lifestyle. They're not saying check out how great these leggings are. They're so durable, they will never rip. They're made sustainably. You can wear them for your rest of your life. You'll pass these down to your grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> They're saying, don't you wanna be cool like these people? This advertisement was also saying that. Don't you wanna be cool like these people? Completely different generation. Honestly, I think this is back, but <laughs> completely different generation. What you see there is planned obsolescence. And that is a form of planned obsolescence that is called perceived obsolescence, where every season there's a new style. Every year, the fashion trends change. You can't go around wearing this outfit anymore. I guess you'd probably be like the coolest kid ever if you wore this outfit now. But, but a couple of years ago, that would not be the case. These things, these things change and these advertisements sell us a new lifestyle every season, which creates a huge amount of waste. 
Additionally, there's another type of planned obsolescence, which is functional obsolescence. So I'm going to read this quote out loud. Our whole economy is based on planned obsolescence. We make good products, we induce people to buy them, and then next year we deliberately introduce something that will make those products old fashioned, out of date, obsolete. We do this for the soundest reason, to make money. This is a real quote from 1958 from an industrial designer talking about planned obsolescence. And so I wanna also, again, invite folks to unmute themselves and yell out, um, what would you think is a, an example, a product example of functional planned obsolescence? Forever changing the style and the design and we can't get things fixed. Mm-hmm, not being able to get things fixed, that's a good one. Who else? Skin tight jeans and now very loose jeans, like in the 60s. Yeah, yeah, so there's style obsolescence right there. Yeah, perceived obsolescence. What about um, functional obsolescence? Something that is made to break. Oh God, everything. <laughs> Phones. <laughs> Phones, yes, How Apple products. Floss. <laughs> yes. Appl appliances. <laughs> yeah, appliances, appliances. Yeah, Apple products are some of the worst perpetuators of this, the way they change their uh, outlets. Um, so you can't use the same chargers year after year. Any other examples folks wanna add? VCRs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now the new stuff, you can't, you can't repair that anymore. My Keurig machine that didn't last a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great example. These are all good examples. This is all planned obsolescence. We live in a society where things are made to break and they are made to be obsolete. And why is this a problem? This is a problem because the stuff that gets made is made in a deeply unethical way. And this, this image is, is I, I should have done a content warning before this, I apologize. This image is really intense. This is a factory collapse from 2013 from a factory in Bangladesh. Um, this happens regularly. This is the fast fashion industry. This was a factory that was creating clothing. Um, the impact of just clothing, just our fast fashion industry, um, is broken down here on the left. The fashion industry is the second largest consumer of water globally. It contributes 20% of global water pollution, 10% of all carbon emissions. The average like clothing worker is making less than $3 a day. That is modern slavery, that is slavery. 85% of all textiles, 85% are thrown away within a year of being made. That's the stuff that gets made, just our clothing that gets made. So when this stuff breaks so quickly, it has to get made again and again. When that stuff go out, goes out of style, it has to get made again and again. And the impact of making that is massive. The other piece of that impact is this stuff is made from oil. So the image that you see in front of you is a visual representation of the amount of oil, fossil fuels, that goes into making a teddy bear and a rubber duck. These things are made from oil. Plastic is a petroleum product. And the majority of the things that we interact with, the fabrics that we interact with, are made from petroleum products, are made from oil. There is very little natural fiber that's still used in fast fashion and in typical product development. So this is not just a problem with how we make things. It is a problem with what we make things from. Oil is a finite resource. There is only so much of it. So we make that stuff, we use it, we throw it away. 
The two outlets that stuff typically goes to when we throw it away are a landfill or an incinerator. And I'm gonna talk about both of those. So first is a landfill. This is a cross section of what it would look like if you basically cut a landfill in half and looked into the center. Um, it is a common misconception that landfills are big stinky places that um, contain a lot of decaying like plastics and stuff. Landfills are actually, um, they are stinky. We'll give them that. Um, they are actually generated to try to keep all of the stuff inside at a complete homeostasis. They're trying to keep that stuff from deteriorating because that will uh, release as many, they'll release more gases, it will spontaneously combust. Um, so landfills actually contain a ton of fill, dirt, um, cement, sand, things like that. Um, and that stuff continues to be volatile. So what ends up happening as this stuff decays is we have greenhouse gases coming out the top, methane, carbon dioxide, and we have uh, leachate coming out the bottom. Basically, when it rains, the water percolates in the landfill and it runs out the bottom containing all of these chemicals that are listed below dioxins, heavy metals, um, carcinogens, cancer-causing materials, and landfill sites attempt to contain these things, but there are case after case after case of those holding ponds breaking, of leaks. Um, we just have to look in our own backyard at the Juniper Ridge landfill um, up in Old Town, Old Town, Maine to know the impact that that's having on the Penobscot River. Um, Landfill impact on the local community is massive, but it also has an impact on climate change. So this graph on the right, um, this is an EPA study showing US methane emissions by source. And you'll see right here, landfills contribute 18% of methane in the atmosphere. Methane is the most harmful greenhouse gas. When we talk about climate change, we need to be talking about landfills. We need to be talking about the third highest contributor of methane in our atmosphere. The other way that, that trash is typically dealt with is through an incinerator. Um, incinerators are often called waste to energy plants. Um, there are massive greenwashing campaigns to try and paint incinerators as a sustainable alternative um, or a um, re renewable energy source because incinerators do generate energy, but the amount of energy that they generate is minuscule based or uh, compared to the amount of impact that they have on the environment. And the only way they could ever be considered a renewable energy source is if we're saying that our trash is uh, an unending source of material. Like our trash is like the sun, our trash is like the air, the wind, our trash is like water, which I, I think is not a good goal <laughs> for us to send. Um, additionally, uh, incinerators are the most polluting form of energy source of, uh, compared to coal or oil. Um, they contribute the highest carbon dioxide, another potent greenhouse gas, um, compared to these other sources. So you can see in this graph here how much higher the amount of carbon dioxide emission um, from incinerators than from even coal-fired power plants, which we know coal-fired is bad. I think we can all agree here, coal-fired power plants are bad. But when told that incineration is a solution, it's really important to stand up and be able to say why that is not the case. So it's not just these materials, these, these facilities that are a problem. It's not just a climate change issue, um, but it's also an environmental injustice issue. So I'm gonna read this quote again. This is a quote, um, from the uh, private consulting firm that was hired to consult for the California Waste Management Board. 
basically the California Waste Management Board asked them, where should we put our polluting infrastructure? And this private consulting form, firm said, all socioeconomic groupings tend to resent the nearby siting of major facilities, but middle and upper socioeconomic status possess better resources to effectuate their position. Basically, nobody wants polluting infrastructure in their communities, but you should put them in poor neighborhoods because they can't fight back. That was their advice. And we can see that all across the country is the poor neighborhoods, the immigrant neighborhoods, the communities of color, those are the neighborhoods that are experiencing impacts from plastic production facilities, from landfills, from incinerators. We see it right here in Maine. The Penobscot community is the community, the First Nations community is the community that's facing the direct impact from the landfill in our own community. And this is a symptom um, of something called redlining. Um, so redlining was a practice that was outlawed in the 70s, um, but it was legal before then. And it was the practice of creating maps like what you're seeing here for major metropolitan areas. Um, so the map that you see here indicates, this is Philadelphia, um, and it indicates red areas, yellow areas, blue areas, and green areas. Um, and this was done in partnership with banks and with cities. And basically it, it identified the undesirable neighborhoods for providing loans, for putting in infrastructure, um, for adding supermarkets, for establishing businesses. Um, it was used most heavily by banks to decide where to grant mortgages and where to not grant mortgages. And we see, even though this is technically illegal now, we see this practice continuing. And when you overlay redlining maps with maps of major polluting infrastructure, you find that those red areas that have been historically marginalized, systemically marginalized, continue to have the highest amount of polluting infrastructure. They also have the highest amount of asthma and cancer rates and skin rashes from this. This is an environmental racism is issue. It's an environmental classism issue. It is what is called environmental injustice and it is rampant across this country. So all of that is if the infrastructure that we have in place works perfectly. That is how it's set up to work. But the reality is it doesn't really. Um, only 9% of all plastic ever made has been recycled. So our recycling infrastructure that we have in place, I'm honestly not gonna talk a lot about recycling because of this fact because our recycling infrastructure is not what it needs to be to deal with the capacity of the problem that we are facing. Only 9% of all plastic ever made has been recycled. The rest is pollution. And because of that, it's estimated that by 2050, there will be more plastic in the oceans than fish. And that actually, I think is now a uh, outdated number. I think that the estimates are sooner than 2050. Um, the crisis of plastic in the ocean is not just a matter of the material of plastic in the ocean, but the chemicals that leach out of that plastic and into the wildlife, into our bodies, into coastal communities. That impact is, um, is massive. And I could talk about that for a really long time, but we're not gonna spend forever on the problem. It's important to understand the intersections of this problem and how at every point in this system, there are intersections of race and class and gender and the systems of injustice are perpetuating each other. They're holding each other up. So when we think about solutions, 
we need to think about those solutions in a way that is systemic. So the image that I'm sharing here is our theory of change. We call it the points of intervention theory of change. And you can see the linear consumption economy in red. We extract resources, we produce them into stuff, we distribute that stuff, we consume it, and we dispose of it. <clears throat> but we also are changing this system. We are finding points of leverage to create change. We're resisting extraction. We're redesigning products and creating new renewable forms of production. We're redesigning and repairing and reusing and recovering and reclaiming our communities. And all of these points of intervention, that's what makes up the movement that we are working for. That's what makes up the type of work that we support and the way that we think the world can change. And we see campuses as a really important part of that. So I'm not gonna harp too much on this because I know that there's not really that many students here, um, but this is an important part of what we do at PLAN, the Post Landfill Action Network. Um, and I think it applies to small communities as well. We see campuses and small communities to be able to test out solutions, to be able to try out new ways of uh, creating resources, new ways of distributing things. And campuses specifically have the incredible uh, privilege of resources and support networks. Um, and that's why we see campus networks as an incredible place to test out zero waste. Additionally, students always have been catalysts for change. The images that you see here are all examples of students and young people who through the years have made massive systemic change. Whether we're talking more recently about Greta Thunberg or the student fossil fuel divestment movement, or we wanna talk about the student nonviolent coordinating committee in the civil rights movement, or students who stood up against apartheid, um, or students against the Vietnam War. All of these examples are times that young people and students stood up and so said, no more, this is too much. We don't wanna live in this world. We wanna live in a different world. And we believe that this movement that we're building here um, can also be powered by that student uh, innovation and student energy. Um, and we're seeing it happen with these examples. So I'm gonna dive into a couple of examples of uh, ways that this change is happening and then we'll get into our discussion, but I wanna pause real quick and just see if there's any questions. Um, I know I've gone all the way down and I wanna see if folks have any questions at this point. So there is a question in the chat. Um, Casey Seaman asks, what do you think about some of the legislation that's being proposed? Are there any parts in it that will be effective in beginning some systematic change? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm assuming that you're talking, are you talking about the break free from plastic uh, legislation? Uh, yes, and, and some of the Green New Deal things and, you know, we're hearing more conversations about it now, which is helpful. So, but, uh, you know, what, what are, are there pieces in there that will really make a difference was what I was wondering. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. I will be fully transparent <clears throat> with you and say that the work that I do is not um, as policy based. So I'm not an expert on the policy that is happening. Um, mm -hmm. I'm much more program based. Um, but uh, well, I do think that the Green New Deal is, um, is really important and has come a long way. Um, the work that we have been focusing on is around the Break Free from Plastic Act. Um, so that's something that I would really encourage folks to look up. Um, an important part of the Break Free from Plastic um, legislation that's being proposed is the investment and the like ground level creation that has happened with folks who are most directly impacted by the problems that the policy is trying to address. 
Um, so I can say that um, having known how that policy has been developed um, for the Break Free from Plastic Act, um, I don't know as much around the Green New Deal, um, but I think that's a really important part of policy development um, because what it does is it ensures that it's basically not creating new problems um, and, and it's going to the root of what the individuals who are most impacted need um, to develop solutions in their own communities. Any other questions? All right, we're gonna keep going. Um, all right, so we're gonna go into solutions. I know we talked about some uh, deep pieces of the problem, um, but we're gonna dig into some solutions. Before we do, I wanna share with you all um, a phrase that we hold at PLAN, um, which is no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. And together we can fix this broken system. And a big part of our work is helping students and young people find what we call their point of intervention, find their point in this system where they can make change on a systemic level um, that will be long lasting. So together we believe we can fix this broken system. Um, okay, so what does points of intervention model look like in practice? This is the fun part. This is the part where I get to talk about solutions, talk about the amazing people who are working in this movement and really making change. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share a couple of solutions with you all. Um, and then we're gonna do our activity, which includes generating solutions yourself. Um, so if you wanna take some notes, um, think about how these things might be applicable in your communities, I invite you all to think about that now in preparation for your breakout group. Um, so starting with, oops, sorry. Let me back go away. Okay, well, um, starting with shutting down pipelines. Um, this is an example of intervening at the point of extraction and the point of distribution. Um, the line three pipeline is a tar sands pipeline um, in the Minnesota region that has been uh, threatening native communities. Um, and shutting that pipeline down is a part of challenging this system of linear consumption economy because it is transporting a dirty fuel, a dirty fossil fuel um, to be created into these uh, short-term products. Another example is divesting from fossil fuels. The fossil fuel divestment movement um, was really the organizing space where I cut my teeth as a, as a college student um, and now has grown massively and really shows the impact that moving your money as a form of protest can have when it comes to massive institutions. There are thousands of campuses, uh, churches, communities, investment funds that have moved their money out of fossil fuels, um, which has created a movement where not only is it a, a form of protest against the fossil fuel industry, but it has also made investment in fossil fuels um, a unsound form of investment. Um, it is not a place where institutions are even making money anymore. Um, and this is a huge, in huge part to student movement. Um, so this is a, a way of intervening in extraction and production. Banning of microplastics. Um, this is another student project. Um, these are students from the University of Santa Barbara um, who successfully banned, I love this story because they successfully banned microbeads on their campus. And for anyone who doesn't know, microbeads um, are often present in the products that you see them holding, um, toothpastes, face washes, and they are literally tiny balls of plastic that are used for exfoliation. 
they're bad for your skin <laughs> and they're really bad for our waterways because we literally just wash them right down the drain. These students ban them on their campus, ban them in their town, ban them in their state, and now they're banned nationally because of these students. This was an example of them intervening at the point of production. So pressuring these company, companies to change their production and the point of consumption. So changing the way that we consume products. Revisioning packaging. Um, this is a company called Ecovative. Uh, packaging is an area of uh, a massive area of waste, especially lifestyle waste, but um, packaging waste is a really big problem in, um, in industry. So beyond lifestyle, um, it becomes a really big problem in industry. And this company, Ecovative, Ecovative is making packaging from mushrooms. So that packaging that you see there is actually made from, that's, that's mushroom, that's mycelium. Um, and so that is intervening at the point of distribution and the point of production. Um, fun fact about this company, they actually are also starting to make um, home like renovation materials. So they're starting to make insulation and they're starting to make um, like wall siding all out of mushroom, um, which is a very new area. I don't know how far they are in that, but that's a really cool area of research that is happening. And then we have fighting for the right to repair, which someone mentioned earlier. This is a really, really, really important point. Um, it is literally illegal to try and repair some of your own stuff. If you open the back of an iPhone, it becomes has waste, hazardous waste, and you're technically not allowed to bring it in to repair. You have to buy a new one, according to the store. So this movement for right to repair, this is a national movement that is working to pass local legislation all across the country. Um, this is a great place to look in to getting plugged in. Um, They're advocating for right to repair legislation um, that will completely change the way that repair is managed across the country. This is an example of intervening at production. If we can repair our stuff, we don't have to produce new stuff and consumption. If you can buy something that's repairable, you're much like much more likely to change your consumption patterns to something that is repairable and easily repairable for a long time, rather than something that you can't repair at all. Um, if you're really interested in repair, another place to look uh, is a company called iFixit. Um, they have super easy to use step-by-step -step videos and toolkits for repairing your items. They'll even sell refurbished parts for repairing everything from the waistband of your jeans to your laptop. Um, so iFixit is a really great um, resource to check out and they support the right to repair legislation through their nonprofit arm. Um, sharing our resources, tool libraries. This is a form of intervening at distribution and consumption. Uh, example here is the West Philadelphia Tool Library. So this is a neighborhood that I just moved out of, um, which had a great tool library where you could rent anything from a plumbing wrench to a lawnmower to a, a guidebook on how to fix your lawnmower. Um, it had so much stuff. And what it did is save individuals from having to each have their own lawnmower, but having a couple lawnmowers for the entire neighborhood. Um, tool libraries are gaining in popularity um, as we learn that <laughs> basically we're being duped by the, the corporate uh, machine. So th this is a really great resource to dig into. Um, reclaiming food waste. Uh, this project is really near and dear to my heart. Scrap Dogs is a um, recently started business by a couple of former students who we used to work with. Um, that's actually based in Rockland, Maine, um, and they serve Rockland and surrounding towns, um, picking up compost, or sorry, picking up food scraps from individuals' homes and from businesses, and then composting it, and then providing soil right back to you. Um, the two individuals that started this were students um, who we worked with and um, went off to start this business. They are what we call plumni or plan alumni. 
um, and they are intervening at the point of production and the point of disposal. And then finally, intervening at the point of disposal, we have fighting it's about against dealing with trash. Oh, excuse me. Did someone have a question? That must have been an accident. Okay, feel free to ask if you if you want to ask a question. Um, intervening at the point of disposal. Uh, this is the fight against the Juniper Ridge landfill again. Um, and shutting down that infrastructure is a really, really important part. Resisting that infrastructure, changing the way that that infrastructure is taking over is a really, really important part of this fight. Um, at the bottom of this slide, there's a link here and I debated whether or not to share this video, but it is like, it's like 14 minutes long. So that would have been basically my whole presentation. Um, but it is uh, the Sunlight Media Collective, which is a youth collective of Penobscot youth um, media creators um, who did a short documentary on the fight against the Juniper Ridge landfill. And it is really, really good, really good. And I think everybody who lives in the state of Maine should watch this video because not only does it help to understand what's going on here, um, but it helps to clarify the way that it is impacting the Penobscot community and the rest of the surrounding community in the Old Town area. Um, the issue with that landfill is they're accepting out of state waste um, and they are constantly uh, expanding. I've been uh, connected to folks living in proximity to this landfill for seven years now. Um, and the landfill has gone through three expansions, three expansions in seven years. That is a unbelievable amount of trash. Um, if you want to get a, a kind of mind numbing <laughs> Uh, feel for the impact of this landfill. Every year, Casella, who operates the landfill, hosts an event called Dinner at the Dump, um, where they basically try to woo the local community into being supporters of their landfill. Um, but they also give out free food, so that's great. Um, and they take a bus to the top of the landfill. Um, and it's very gimmicky, but it is a way to see the impact of that landfill because it is it's a view from the top of the landfill um and that's all trash so i would i would highly suggest learning a little bit more about this and getting involved and i'll make sure that these slides get shared so that you all have the link to this video um to follow along with what what's going on here um all right so we're gonna do an activity um, let me see. So we have about 10 minutes left. So Riley, if we can do breakout groups of like five people for let's say five minutes. And what we're going to talk about while you're getting that set up, um, we're going to talk about the question of how can your community take action using the points of intervention? So thinking about all the examples of intervening at these different points of intervention, how can your community take action? What would different projects look like? How could you engage? What could you support? Um, and feel free to like throw ideas that are similar to what we just shared. Um, that's why they're there to really jog those thoughts. And I do wanna really encourage folks to go beyond individual action. Think about systemic change. Um, so Riley, do we have the groups ready? Cool. All right, go ahead for five minutes and then we'll come back and share back.
but yeah. yes, <laughs> it does feel good. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Hi. Hello. Thank you. Um, so we don't have a lot of time left, um, and I do want to share a couple of resources at the end. So I want to open up space for three or so minutes for folks to just share what they talked about or anything else they want to discuss in this space. Any questions? I want to leave like two minutes at the end. So um, go ahead. Or Riley, do you want to facilitate if there's like hand raise? Do you have a system? Yeah, I think if folks just want to shout out or use the raise hand feature, that's fine too. Casey? Yeah. Yeah, I can I can start off a little bit because we were talking to Roshanna who was out collecting trash as we were <laughs> as Kay was doing this, which I thought was so awesome. <laughs> this this is a, this is a conference in action, man. That was I thought that was great. But there um, we go. It, it got us really talking. I think about um, the Break Free from Plastic Act and and the the things that we can do with our local legislators to start to make an impact in some of those points of intervention locally. Like I, I talk to our state legislators quite often. So now I can talk to them about this too, because that's that's a critical piece and learning more about it. So that was that was a big piece of what we were talking about. And, and what, what one of the things that we talked about was, um, something for you haven't covered and that is waste energy and uh, a few people now are talking about net zero um, building and we have a college very near me called <clears throat> unity college that built uh, a dorm a new dorm a number of years ago that uh, essentially i think takes no energy from the from the the, uh, the grid, but that may be no net. So it's built very tight and it has uh, solar panels on the roof and so on. And that's mm -hmm. something that we uh, um, need to talk about as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point, Peter. So talking about the waste of energy, you know, I also didn't talk a, a ton about food waste. Um, there's a lot of forms of waste that um hopefully when you go away from this presentation um what happened to me when i started to become what i call a trash nerd um is seeing waste everywhere wasted potential wasted energy wasted resources wasted food um so that's that's a great point and i think that's a really good example of you said it was unity college yeah unity college has, great yes. So um, in our little breakout group, am I there? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I had to ask Faye about um, how you build consensus, how you build a momentum uh, for any uh, good cause, uh, specifically environmentally based cause. And um, she, Faye made some fabulous points about, first of all, escalation, which includes um, keeping at it and don't just send one email and be discouraged if you don't hear back. Send 45 emails to your uh, city councilors or district representatives and uh, meet them in person if they don't respond and um, build power through uh, children's uh, letter writing and art projects. Um, get yourself in the news. So it, it's just, you know, um, on any of these issues, it's so hard to break through the mundane and the routine and build momentum. And so that was mainly what, <clears throat> what we talked about in our group. And we have time to hear from, well, actually no one else. I was gonna say one more, but we are almost out of time. So I'm gonna go back and share my screen just to wrap up. Thank you everyone who shared. Um, and I want to encourage, if you all want to have future conversation about this, um, I hope, Riley, at the end of this, you can share info about future Sierra Club meetings um, so conversation can continue. Um, so I'm going to put a quick plug again for the event on the 22nd, um, really looking for organizers or for, for anyone in the area 
to show up with signs. This is the caravan for Mother Earth against the um, the dumping and the importing of main weight or out of state waste um, at the Juniper <laughs> Ridge landfill in partnership with Penobscot organizers. Um, so I hope folks show up to that. Um, this info will be um, in this presentation, which you all will have at the end of this uh, session. Another event that I want to plug really quickly is uh, specifically for college and high school students. So um, for anyone who has college and high school students in their lives, please feel free to share this free virtual event. Um, it is the fourth event in a series um, called the Beyond Waste Student Summits. It's a weekend, um, intensive weekend training. And this May 1st event uh, theme is on establishing a circular economy and it's going to be on fashion forward. So talking about fast fashion um, and thinking about thrift stores and free stores and um, oh, circular economic, economic systems. Um, was that a question from someone? No? Okay, cool. Um, so you can email Ramiro at postlandfill.org to sign up if you'd like. Um, finally, we're always looking for new members, so feel free to share this with uh, the college students or staff in your life. Um, you can always contact us at uh, info at Postlandfill, which I'll put on the last slide, um, and a couple of additional resources. You can sign up for our monthly newsletter. I've also included some databases here, a mutual aid database, which is an awesome form of zero waste and community resiliency um, and campus organizing tactics um, for remote organizing. And this actually, um, Abby, the question that you asked about getting the attention of your representatives, um, town representatives and campus administration are basically the same. Um, so this remote organizing toolkit, I think would be really relevant for what you're working on as well. Okay. Um, so feel free to pull tools from that. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for having me. I know we're a little over time. I'm happy to stay a couple of minutes um, and continue chatting. Um, but if folks need to leave, I understand. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Faye. Thank you. Riley, did you have wrap up you wanted to do? I did, yeah, just super briefly. Um, so again, yeah, as was said, oh, wrong slide this should be right uh so as they said thank you all so much for coming um and just wanted to let you all know about our next events this week for earth week so tomorrow our event is sue inches who is the author of advocating the environment how to gather your power and take action which will be released this summer she'll be sharing effective strategies for advocating for the environment attendees will leave this conversation feeling both empowered and motivated to use their new skills um so we highly recommend that you uh join us for that and again that the link and way to get registered for that can be found on the sierra club main website um and additionally feel free to follow us on social media and keep up with everything we're doing and yeah thank you all so much for coming and i kept thank you riley uh riley can i make a comment sure um it's for you and faye is faye still there i'm here um uh, faye Many, many years ago, uh, I think one of the important things is to give positive feedback to companies that are doing the right thing. I'm sure you guys you know, are doing that. Many years ago, I was working for Oxfam and I stumbled upon the fact that UPS Corporation had donated millions of dollars to fund what they called the Prepared Food Rescue Program. And I think in 30 major um, metropolitan areas in the United States, they uh, got you know connected with a local uh, 501c3 not, you know charity, and they funded these trucks, these refrigerated trucks that would go around every night and pick up all this leftover food from you know like fast food joints and corporate cafeterias. That's how I, I found out about it because of corporate cafeteria, and. Uh, I was really impressed with that at the time because they were helping to save, you know, a lot of waste from going to waste as opposed to in being able to feed people who were desperate for food. And uh, I've always been very impressed with UPS and I don't know what they're doing these days, but they were very supportive many years ago for this kind of, you know, kinds of programs. 
um, that you were talking about today. You know, eliminating said, waste and also um, the other side of it, like Oxfam and so on, feeding people. So anyway. I love that idea, Casey. Thank you for mentioning that because I struggle with attitudes and polarization in our community and how people like us could be considered freaks for even wasting an hour in the day talking about this stuff and um, thanking people who are doing such a good job and even having a festival to honor them if we can ever get back in person would just be magnificent because there are community organizations and, re and industries even and schools that are just doing some very, very good things and um, an implicit way to urge others to get on the bandwagon. It's a beautiful yep. idea. We need to do more of it. Well, I, I'd be willing to try and help and dig into it. There's a a huge UPS distribution center about a mile from our house. So mm -hmm. I probably could, if, if uh, Faye knows how to get a hold of me, it's Dan, yeah. Dan Kostreva. Well, Hannaford, Casey, so. uh, you, we all share a supermarket chain, Hannaford's. Right. I think Hannaford's has a, a sustainability program. I don't know, seems like they're trying to do more and more, at least around our area in Belfast. And I think it's worth uh, plugging their efforts as well. It is, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for this great presentation today. My wonderful. wife, Casey, and I absolutely loved it. Yep. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Thank thanks, you. Faye. It was great to hear from you. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, everyone. And Riley, you're awesome. Thank Let's you. Say thank you all. <laughs> Yay. Nice job. Nice job. Nice job. Yeah, for sure. Awesome.